you may find along the way that you thought, oh, I want to be an actor. Uh, and you find out later, you know, I'd, I'd like to be a costume designer. I, I've seen that. <clears throat> and or, or director or whatever. And, you know, so have some flexibility. Uh, don't kind of set your say, uh, oh, you know, I'm going to be a director because you may find that that may not be your strongest suit. This episode is brought to you by the best-selling book, Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, How to Turn Your Independent Film into a Money-Making Business. Learn more at filmbizbook.com. I'd like to welcome to the show, George Stevens Jr. How are you doing, George? I'm doing well. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the show, sir. I'm I'm excited to talk to you. You've lived a very interesting life, sir, to say the least. <laughs> well, I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> You have you have definitely gone through some journeys in your life and in, uh, in the film industry and in politics and so many different areas. So, um, my first uh, my first question to you is: How did you get started in the film industry? And I know your father was a little well known director. The little guy started out a few years ago. Um, but how did you get your interest? How did you get your foot in the door, if you will? Well, as as, as you suggest, my father was a director, but my just. For full disclosure, my great grandmother was born in San Francisco after the Civil War and became an actress and a fine actress on the stage. And she was known as the youngest Ophelia to the great Edwin Booth's Hamlet. Um, he was the greatest Shakespearean actor, really, I think, in American history. Certainly, his Hamlet is renowned. And she started five generations of Stevenses in show business. Her daughter, Georgie Cooper, uh, was my father's mother, and she married an actor called Landers Stevens, and it kind of went on from there. And yes, having been born to a father who was a director, um, at, at the time I was born, he was photographing Laurel and Hardy comedies as a cameraman. And, uh, and 1935, he directed Alice Adams with Catherine Hepburn and Fred McMurray at age 30. And uh, from then on, he just made great films, uh, one after the other. Um, had a three-year experience in World War II overseas uh, in that chronology. And when he came back from the war, I was my, a couple of years after that, I was graduating from high school. And I didn't have a summer job. And he said, well, you can help me. And he gave me two jobs. One, um, I did, did this at home, and was to break down Theodore Dreiser's An American Tragedy, the great no novel of a, of a murder in, uh, in, in the Eastern United States, because he was about to write the screenplay for what became called A Place in the Sun, with Montgomery Clift and Elizabeth Taylor and Shelley Winters, which was the, his first Oscar winning picture as a director. Um, and I broke that down and gave him all the information and two notebooks. And then also I was to read the stories they sent from Paramount Pictures where his company was, they'd send books, screenplays, uh, all sorts of stuff. And it was pretty, actually it was kind of boring because most of these were kind of treacly love novels, you know, and for a 17 year old on hot summer afternoons. Yeah, but one afternoon, a smaller book came and I picked it up and I read it um, in the afternoon. And I went to see him that night with the book in my hand and I walked in, he was in bed reading. And I said, dad, I said, this is really a good story. I think you ought to read it. And he said, why don't you tell me the story? <laughs> so I started, my brain started working and I started reconstructing this book that I'd read and I walked around his bed telling him the story of Shane. Wow. It was Jack Shaver's novel. So and, uh, you know, I, I, I could get more interested in that, a little boy <laughs> with this gun gunslinger oh, yeah. he had. Uh, and then the next summer, I was uh, in Jackson Hole, Wyoming with my first job on a movie set. I was what was called company clerk, which I'm, meant I kept track of stuff. But I was right near the camera and I did not know it was gonna be 
a classic film. Shane is celebrating its 70th anniversary this year. So it was 71 years ago that I was in Jackson Hole and watching Alan Ladd and Van Heflin and Gene Arthur and this little boy from New York who'd never been west of New Jersey. Um, and uh, he, uh, uh, Jack Palance, who came, it was his first major role. Uh, and so I was there, I, I, I was seeing it all and, and I did kind of fall in love with it. You got, so, I mean, you were born into the business. I know a lot of people who've been born in the business that don't get bitten by the bug, but it seems like you were right. uh, not only bitten, uh, you were not, you were mauled. <laughs> By the bug, yeah, and, and, and some some people get bitten badly by it <laughs> in the wrong way. You know, that particularly, I mean, I'm very fortunate that I had a wonderful father and mother, uh, but sons of famous fathers, they're, you know, at the time that they're, 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 most of them were having difficulty with it, and I think largely by the nature of my father, um, it worked out beautifully for him and for me. We became partners and did things together later. Now, you um, you also worked on you worked on a, as a PA on a bunch of your father's movies. Uh, one specific one specifically was a, a little film called Giant. Um, what yes. was it like being on set watching Elizabeth Taylor and James Dean? And what's the biggest lesson you pulled from being on the set of of such a classic film like that? Gosh, there are so many, Alex, um, but. It was a great experience because I gotten out of the Air Force, I gotten out of college, Occidental College, and the Korean War ended, and and they postponed my commission for a year, and I had nothing to do, and at that very moment, or a couple of months before, Dad had acquired the novel Giant, and made a deal with Warner Brothers to make it, so I spent nine months with him and two writers in his living room working on the script of Giant. I obviously as a junior partner observer uh, sure. for the most part, but you, know, you started to learn about film structure. And then one night, then I went in the Air Force and when he started shooting just before I was in Los Angeles and he said, I wanna go show you a movie. So my mother and dad and I went to Musso Frank's on Hollywood Boulevard and then across the street to the Egyptian theater and saw Elia Kazan's East of Eden. Oh. And the reason he wanted me to see it was that this young actor, never seen before, comes on the screen and had this way of kind of walking and these oh. hooded eyes, and it was James Steen. And dad was considering casting him in the role of Jet Rink, who in the book was described as this sort of burly big fellow. Uh, but Jimmy Dean was... Uh, shooting Rebel Without a Cause at Warner Brothers. And he kept hanging around dad's office because he knew about Giant and he wanted to be in Giant. And though he was very different than Jet Rink had been imagined, dad thought he was a kind of a once in a lifetime talent and gave him that role. And when you think about it, the three stars, Rock Hudson was 28. These actors all went on to play in their 50s you know, with gray hair. Elizabeth was 23 and Jimmy Dean was 23. Oh my and for what it was worth, I was 23. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, but to watch this work go on, being in the Air Force, I, I flew to uh, Virginia to see the film shot in Virginia where the film begins, where Elizabeth Taylor is the daughter of this man with a great uh, stallion, War Winds. And, Rock Hudson comes from Texas to buy war winds and they fall in love very quickly, et cetera, et cetera. So I was there and then I would fly into Marfa, Texas, and then I would be on the set. And, and there were lots of experiences. I've a, a sad experience. Uh, I was on the set very late in the picture. Jimmy Dean had finished all of his shooting right. and he had, he, he had agreed not to drive, he had a little race car and he'd agreed not to drive it while the film was going on because if he broke his leg, everybody would be out of work. He understood that, but he'd finished shooting. So he bought a sport, a Porsche Spider, I think a Porsche Spider 500, it was called. Yeah. 
<laughs> and I was on the set one day and Jimmy walked in with his kind of tinted glasses and told me about the car. And he said, you want to ride? So I walked outside the big sound stage at Warner Brothers with all those, you know, narrow roads. You've seen pictures if you haven't been there. And this little gray roadster sitting on the ground seemed so tiny. And we got into it and he revved it up and we drove through the studio lots. Uh, thank God a prop truck wasn't coming or a studio policeman and right. came back parked, and he said, what do you think? And I said, well, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. <laughs> well, now, of course, the, the sad part of the story is that two, two weeks later, uh, Jimmy had told my father he was going to ship the car up to Salinas from Los Angeles, where he was going to be racing. And uh, but on the morning of the day, he decided not to ship it. And he and his mechanic got in the car and Jimmy drove it up and they had that accident on the Pacific Coast Highway. Yeah. Um, and Jimmy was really a, uh, he was a complicated guy, but he was talented and, and fun. And I think he had a, plans to become a director. Uh, and, uh, you know, but it was a, a, such a tragic loss. And it is strange how, you know, this is 65 years ago, giant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, how his memory uh, lives today. Oh, without question. He's, I mean, I've been, I, I've been at the observatory. I've seen the, uh, the yeah. plaque there and the statue really? of, uh, of James Dean. Yeah. I mean, he's, I mean, rebel with those, those movies, uh, giant rebel and, and East of Eden. I mean, they just, it is one of the tragic stories of, of, of Hollywood history uh, without question. Yeah. What could have, what else could have been, what else could he have done if given the yeah. opportunity? It was, it was, it's pretty brilliant. And, and you think just, he, was, he was by then 24, had a whole life ahead of him. Uh, right. You asked about a lesson on giant and one that might yeah. be interested to yeah, your please. filmmaker listeners. Mm -hmm. um, we were editing the film. I was now out of the air force, mm -hmm. you know, and three hour and 20 minute film giant. Yes. We, we premiered it at the Turner Classic Movies Festival last year, Steven Spielberg and I introduced a restoration of it. And that film plays to see it with an audience uh, it, it, all those years later. Um, and they're just with it every minute on the big giant IMAX screen. It, it, you know, it's a film about an independent women, woman they weren't making films about independent women in 1956. And it's a film about the Hispanic problem or that, that existed back then. And it's an issue we are still working with in our country. So the film is so far ahead of its time and its, uh, and its kind of values uh, and concerns. But we were editing and we've been, I've been working with him for a year in the editing room. Again, hot summer, you know, and I've got a golf game to worry about. And, <laughs> and we'd had two previews and, and I said to him, just the two of us there, and, 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 you know, we're running the picture. And I said, dad, I said, this picture, we've had two previews, audiences love it. I think just, don't you want to just get it out there? And he looked at me and he said, uh, when you think how many man hours I think today it said man and woman hours are going to be spent over the years watching this picture, people sitting and watching it. How much time will be spent? Don't you think it's worth a, a little more of our time right now to make it as good as we can? Oh. And it's a lesson that I took with me in everything that I've done uh, in that idea that, and uh, that it's just, I just finished a book it's called My Place in the Sun, Life in the Golden Age of Hollywood and Washington. And I was finishing it during COVID, which gave me time. And I worked on it like giant. I just would go back, to, you know, quote, real one, as the way he would do chapter one and go through it and just polish it and make it as good for the audience as you can. So the lesson is respect for the audience. Right. And I think that should be at, in the head of every filmmaker absolutely without question now you were when you were on the set of giant you, you had a young elizabeth taylor which was your age at the time um yeah. 
she is obviously a legend and what she was able to do. I've got to imagine, guy to guy, you must have had a crush on her. I mean, every man on that set probably had a crush on her. Well, but she I was met her age. <laughs> well, I met her a few years before when Dad oh, was a place in the sun. And oh. I came on the set on a Saturday. And Montgomery Clift and Elizabeth Taylor were shooting a scene. Right. And I watched Dad direct the scene. And a quick story, because you sure. have people who make films. And, and and he said, Monty, why, why don't you go over there by the pool table? And Elizabeth, why, why don't you just start at the door? And then we'll just try the And so they went and they did the scene with a clip, clip, clip script girl, clip person, giving her, you know, corrections if they missed the dialogue and all. Mm -hmm. And dad said, all right. He said, oh, well, let's do it one more time. And so they went back and they did it again. Yeah. You know? And oh, uh, so that's, that's good. Uh, let's do it one more time. And so God, they go, then they do it again. And then after that, Monty comes over and comes up close to him and starts asking questions. And Elizabeth comes over. And, you know, anyway, and, and anyway, they kind of got the scene all set and it was time for lunch. And, and I said to dad, I said, why did you have him do it three times before you gave him any instruction? And he said, sometimes it's helpful for the actors to know that they may need some help. <laughs> In other words, that's brilliant. That's actually pretty brilliant. It's a brilliant you know, way of that, thinking about it. That, you know, his his job was to make the actors comfortable. Sure. But in order to give them advice, the advice has to be welcome. If he goes over and says, no, no, why don't you go here and you go there and do that? Anyway, it's just a little lesson in uh, in directing. But on that day, he introduced me to Elizabeth on the mm -hmm. set. I mean, and she was without question, in my mind, the most beautiful person on the planet, you know? And then as we're getting ready for lunch, uh, Elizabeth walks over, said, would you like to go to lunch? So I found myself walking down the streets of the Paramount studio. Um, we were both 17. <laughs> and, right. uh, and we go to the commissary and she kind of walks in and I follow in her wake as the woman takes her to a corner table and all. And, and then we had... And, and she, she, she said, what, what would you like? And I was kind of fumbling around with the menu. She said, I'm going to have a hamburger and a chocolate milkshake. And, and, I, and I said, that works. Let's do that. And so I had uh, lunch with Elizabeth Taylor, which was, and, and, and throughout many episodes in my book, because Elizabeth uh, kept coming in and out of my life and uh, right up to the very end of hers. Uh, and uh, she's a, she was a you know, wonderful talent and great fun. That must have been that's just amazing. Well, listen, with all of the, I mean, you grew up in the golden age of Hollywood and you were yeah. in the midst of it. You were in the thick of it. Were there any actors or actresses that had a major impression on you in your life? Well, obviously many from on the screen um, and particularly some of the older ones, Jimmy Stewart, and sure, sure. Henry Fonda and Betty Davis. And I, when I st started the American Film Institute, that's another story. Sure, so we sure. used to, we, I, I started the American Film Institute Life Achievement Award. And, uh, you know, the first was John Ford and the second was James Cagney and uh, Orson Welles and Jimmy Stewart and Capra and uh, uh, Fred Astaire. It's gone on a, a few other names, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and... Uh, so I knew all of those greats, but I think the two who, because I had a, I worked with them in a, a personal situations, mm -hmm. were um, Sidney Poitier and Jack Lemmon. Uh, they were a few years older than I am, but more of my generation. Mm -hmm. And I, I knew I knew them in all aspects of their lives. Uh, we became great friends, but I did I produced and directed and wrote separate but equal the story of Brown versus the Board of Education, a miniseries mm -hmm. uh, that won the Emmy for the outstanding miniseries. And I did another only, I've only done two miniseries and both won the Emmy, one with Jack and one with Sydney. Um, and, uh, and Jack was just this 
extraordinary, gifted oh. fellow who could do drama and comedy and and was such fun. And Sydney had all the, all the great human qualities in addition to being such a pioneer in the matter of, and separate but equal was about equal justice. He played mm -hmm. Thurgood Marshall, pro, uh, arguing, uh, de developing and arguing the case against segregated schools in the Supreme Court that led to the outlawing of segregated schools. So those two, th those are two pretty, pretty impressive ones to say the least, uh, both mm -hmm. legends in their own right. Uh, because you were in the golden age so much, is there any misconceptions that you people have of that time in Hollywood, of that time in filmmaking in general? Any misconceptions that you think that uh, that you can think that come to, to your mind? I guess what I, I don't think I guess there are all kinds of conceptions, Alex. Uh, but uh, one is it looks like a lot of fun. It was really hard work. Oh. And uh, make and making the great films, particularly the, uh, you know, the, the, accepting those challenges and and films are filled with adversity. If something's going to go wrong, you know, and, and, and if you're talking from the director's standpoint, uh, how do you deal with adversity? How do you deal with personalities? Uh, but when you tie a ribbon around it. Uh, you know, Turner Classic Movies, it's just amazing how so often you turn on and there's something that's just delightful. Um, and uh, it's, uh, th there's another phrase that's kind of part of the Stevens family um, that uh, it, I can, it involves another little story, but dad and I Please. went to the Academy Awards in 1952. Um, and I sat next to him and Joseph L. Mankiewicz came on the stage who direct, had won the Oscar the year before for All About Eve. And he read the nominees for Best Director. Um, and he said, uh, John Huston, The African Queen, uh, William Wyler, Detective Story, Vincent Minnelli, An American in Paris, Elia Kazan, a streetcar named Desire, Ooh. and George Stevens, A Place in the Sun. Pretty the good a, year. It's a pretty good year to say that. Competition was stiff that year, let's just say. Yeah, and I wouldn't be telling you this story if John Houston had won for African Queen. My, <laughs> my father won his first Oscar for oh, A Place in the Sun. And wow. we were riding home that night, and the Oscar was in the seat between us. He was driving the car. Uh, a little old school there. Um, and the Oscar was on the seat between us. And for some reason, he looked at me and he said, you know, he said, we'll have a better idea what kind of a film this is in about 25 years. Now, this is when movies came and went. There were no Cinematheques. There was no DVD. There was no streaming. Um, but he, having grown up in the theater and having read the great plays, understood that the important thing about a film was would it stand the test of time? And he did not know that the 17-year-old sitting next to him would one day be the founder of the American Film Institute, which is based on the idea of movies that last and the test of time, or the Kennedy Center Honors, mm -hmm. which is about artists whose work stands the test of time. But it is also like respecting the audience. This idea of the test of time uh, is kind of how I frame my appreciation for my own work, for you know the work that, that I value and treasure. Now, how did you, so, so you, since you brought up the AFI, which is obviously a legendary institution, a film institution, um, one of the greatest film schools ever to be created, as well as the honors that you created, the Lifetime Achievement Award, which I watched every year when they came out. I started in the 80s uh, when it started yeah. to come out. And I you know, remember Clinton, Marty and Steven and, you know, Jack and, yeah. uh, and these these guys. There was just so much fun, especially when Robin yeah. Williams showed up. Uh <laughs> yeah. 
or John Stewart, uh, or, yeah. or or Rickles, or Rickles. I mean, destroying uh, yeah. Scorsese, which was in the, in yeah. the way only Rickles could do. <laughs> yeah. So what? How did you begin, and what caused you to begin to create the AFI, uh, which is pretty, pretty you know audacious yeah. goal to start off. Well, I was I I after Giant, I worked with my father. I started directing. I directed mm -hmm. Peter Gunn, Alfred Hitchcock presents those mm -hmm. kind of shows. And then I went to work with my father on the diary of Anne Frank. And we completed that. I was associate producer. And then he got behind schedule and I directed all of the location work in Amsterdam. He had always done his own location work. Mm -hmm. So it was a big step up for me. Um, but I, I did kind of joke to my friends that I, that I said, I think I'm spending, I'm going to devote my entire life to becoming the second best film director in my family. Um, and then Edward R. Murrow, mm -hmm. the great broadcaster, came into my life. President Kennedy had been elected, had asked Ed to run the United States Information Agency, which made the Voice of America telling America's story abroad. And they had a film division. They made 300 documentaries a year. And Ed wasn't satisfied with the documentaries. And he asked me to come run the uh, uh, motion picture division of USIA. And it took me into the new frontier and President Kennedy and just a whole exhilarating new world. And I was uh, making films. I mean, I was able to, Ed wanted a total rejuvenation of what was being done under the more staid Eisenhower administration. And I brought in lots of young filmmakers who went on to have great careers and we made wonderful films. And I, I love one thing about President Kennedy, he was so eloquent and he was off had wonderful quotes <clears throat> in his speeches. And one that I remember I'd written down, he, he, he read the ancient, ancient Greek poetry, you know, and he loved to quote. And, and then he spoke of the Greek definition of happiness, mm -hmm. which the ancient Greeks said, is the fullest use of one's powers along lines of excellence. And I realized that Ed Murrow and President Kennedy had put me in the saddle of Greek happiness. Mm -hmm. I was making films, loving what I was doing along lines of excellence and for public purpose. So uh, it was a wonderful, Murrow and Kennedy were, uh, great influences on me at age 30, 29 and 30, when I came to that job. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1967, but I had, you know, in the Kennedy government, because there, no, there's not much about film going on. And I, you know, had earned some prominence because people were conscious of the films we were making and working with Murrow. And so people would come to me when it was an issue of film and, the National Endowment for the Arts was created to support the arts, the first legislation uh, funding for the arts. And they knew how to, they could give grants to ballet companies or uh, symphony orchestras, but what do they do about film? Mm -hmm. uh, you can't give a grant to MGM, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so right. it came to me and I suggested an American Film Institute because I had been working with young filmmakers and knew that we needed better opportunity and training. I was conscious of the disappearing of our film heritage that all the films made on nitrate stock from the right. beginning up to the 1940s were disappearing, you know, catching on fire or in, in great archive fires or, you know, so we started this film rescue program at AFI. And uh, I was asked to run it. And, uh, actually, Gregory Peck was the first chairman and Sidney Poitier, to bring his name up again, was vice chairman of AFI when we started it. Now, th at that time, and correct me if I'm wrong, there weren't that many film schools or programs in the country at all, right? In the 60s. There were several. There, there, you know, the UCLA and USC right. had film programs, sure. Columbia and NYU, maybe a few others. But they were part of four-year courses right and we had a theory i had a theory that what we needed was a bridge from education to the profession and so we called our 
students, fellows, and they came uh, for two years uh, to gain that added knowledge. Oh, you, you weren't required to have been a film student. Uh, you know, I was as interested in what they were going to bring to the screen mm -hmm. as to what whether they knew how to run a moviola, you know. <laughs> On, uh, among our first outstanding students, one was Terrence Malick. Uh, and Terry had made one little 13-minute uh, film, I think, in the back of a taxi cab. Uh, but he had he was a, a Rhodes Scholar. Uh, he was teaching philosophy at MIT. He'd been a journalist. Mm -hmm. He was going to bring something to the screen. And another was an art student in Philadelphia, whom we gave a grant to make a, a little film called The Grandmother, which you can picture a perfect little film about a grandmother. It was quite weird. Um, and then he came to AFI and his name was David Lynch. Yeah, I knew where you were going with that one. <laughs> you, you, you were ahead of me. I was uh, ahead of you on that one. <laughs> the second you said weird, and I already felt that was David coming in. I mean, yeah, who are some, for the audience, can you kind of talk a little bit about who the alumni are? Because you have, you know, the AFI has popped out some of cinema's Best auteurs and best filmmakers. Yeah, uh, yes. Janusz Kaminski, the cinematographer who does all of Steven Spielberg's films, uh, Darren Aronofsky, Caleb Deschanel, who was one of the first fellows and is still a top cinematographer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, oh gosh, and so, somebody, the woman who directed Coda. Oh yeah, um, yes, she's there, uh, and 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 just uh, outstanding. I wish I had, had the list in front of me, but I'm. Those are I'm a few of them. Memory, but uh, just many, many wonderful filmmakers are from Ed Zwick and uh, Marshall. I have Hurst. had it. I've had yeah. Ed on the show. Ed is such a wonderful. Oh, such Isn't a wonderful he? soul. Oh, he's such a wonderful. It's like talking to, when I had him on the show. It's like talking to the Church of Cinema. He's ah. just so just the reverence, like yourself, yeah. the reverence for cinema is remarkable. You mentioned that you worked on Alfred Hitchcock Presents as a director. Am I yeah. am I fair to say that you met Mr. Hitchcock and, and spoke to him at, or worked with him in what way? Indeed, yes. Oh, please, Actually, you have to tell me some stories about uh, Alfred, please. <laughs> yes. Well, I, Actually, only to say, only almost to say hello when I was directing Alfred Hitchcock because he would busy making psycho or something but he had a wonderful woman joan harrison english mm -hmm. woman who ran it and i really worked through joan but then when i uh, i started the afi uh hitchcock would come and do wonderful seminars at oh. afi he was just so uh, uh so precise about movie making and wanted to simplify it and he, i remember him saying uh, how important the screenplay is. And, uh, it, it, and he said, once the screenplay uh, is right, he says, it, 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 it's automatic. It, it, uh, and, then they, and then somebody said, well, why, why don't you let somebody else then go direct it? He said, they may screw it up. <laughs> In that droll way he used to speak. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Oh, that's we, we, we honored him with the AFI Life Achievement Award show. I saw that um, one. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he, uh, he was very much at the end of his career. He died the next year. Um, mm. and, uh, but he is, what you see is what you get with Hitch. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. That, 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 that manner and attitude. Uh, is is who he is um as a director we all go through times that the we feel like the world is going to come crash down around us on set uh during a production what was that out of all the projects you've been on or been on your father's set or your set what was the biggest calamity or thing that you obstacle that came across and how did you overcome it in the day gosh uh, i've been trying to think of my father's films they were uh so frequent that uh, this is not right in the line, but I'll, 
I'll tell you a story of his and a story of mine. Um, the day we were going to shoot the scene where Jack Palance gunned down, guns down Stonewall Tory in mm -hmm. front of Grafton Saloon mm -hmm. in Shane, which is, has to be one of the three, I don't know what the other two are, most famous gunshots in films. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, the, Dad had this idea of of he wanted the muddy street, and he, he, you know, and he was looking for clouds up there in the Tetons. And he got there, and it was a Saturday, and they hadn't gotten that they've watered the street, but it was not. And and he did not, and he was willing to send the whole crew home for Saturday, bring them back on Sunday, and he said, "Get water from the river. I want this street flooded." And if you remember. Stonewall Tory, the little Southerner, when he gets off his horse and starts walking toward the saloon where Jack Palance is standing on the boardwalk in front of it. He's sliding through this mud. His foot, footsteps are so unsteady. But for dad, that was a disaster. You know, he knew how important that scene was to him. He, he decided to send the crew home at whatever cost and bring them back the next day because that scene had to be perfect. When I was working with Sidney Poitier, um, and this is a more personal, um, I had uh, been doing a lot of stuff since Peter Gunn. I'd founded the AFI, Kennedy Center Honors, this and that. And, and for the, actually, Separate But Equal was the first time I'd been directing, uh, I'd produced and written the murder of Mary Fagan with Jack Lemon, which won the Emmy. Now I'm doing this. And I hadn't, but Sydney believed in me, loved the script. Both Jack and Sydney refused to do television, but based on scripts I handed them, they agreed to do television in these instances. And we were f filming a scene. Sydney has been down in the South and seen the trouble there and, and has gotten people in Clarendon County African-Americans to agree to file a suit that would become part of the Brown versus Board of Education legal case. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he comes back up to New York where the NAACP Legal Defense Fund law offices are. <clears throat> he comes in late. Several of the lawyers are playing poker in the, you know, and, and Sidney comes in, puts his stuff down, comes and sits down with them and plays a hand of poker before telling him <clears throat> what the story is in South Carolina. I hadn't seen the comedies that Sidney had made with Cosby, you know, were really great stuff. And Sidney started doing some kind of comic stuff that it wasn't what I was expecting. And I, I kind of had cut and said, asked him to change the lighting, made an excuse and kind of walked around. And only place we could find was a storeroom with lights and junk and everything. And I walk in, with Sydney and there's just the two of us. And I said, Sydney, I said, I'm not quite sure what's, what, what we're doing in this scene. And I, I don't think I phrased it very well. And that wonderful face looked at me with those eyes. And he said, well, what is it that you want done in this scene? And I saw this whole thing falling apart. You know, <laughs> it's at the first kind of direction I give him, you know, and and I just stood there and we looked at one another, and I don't know where it came from, but I said, um, I see Thurgood Marshall as a man with secrets. Sidney says, when that is what you want, say that word. We went back to work and we never had a false moment the rest of the way. But it's, 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 you know, I've, I, I look back on it, thankfully, of, you know, if I would faltered there, it could have been uncomfortable going forward. Right. You know, it's really interesting. That's such a great uh, thing because we, each actor is his or her own world and they work in a very specific way. And it's really interesting because if you have, two or three or four actors in a scene and they all are working in different styles and different ways yeah. as a director, it's difficult to, you can't just do a broad direction. You got to do this to that one. That one's being method. Right. That one's not being method. And 
and let's not even get into mm-hmm. the personalities and egos of the situation. <laughs> it's a yeah. very interesting job, uh, directors. And, have, and, isn't a, it? And, a, and, a, and a very good rule of thumb is if you have something difficult, I mean, if it's everything fine, but if there's something and you want to address something with one actor, uh, if, 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 you know, things are difficult and you want to address something with one actor, mm-hmm. kind of break it up and then quietly take the actor aside and talk to them one-on-one. Yeah. Uh, you, you don't want to uh, embarrass an actor or, you know, in front of the other actors or, right. you know, then they might feel they have to dig in or justify themselves. So private attention to individual actors is very important. Now, with all the professional accomplishments you've had in your life, which is the one that you are the most proud of? Gosh. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'll pick one for you. It's a film called George George Stevens, A Filmmaker's Journey. I made it um, shortly after my father's death, and it's a film biography of my father. And I'm pleased to say that... uh, some friends and colleagues and some strangers say that it's the best documentary about a filmmaker ever. And it was so important to me. Uh, and I am so happy that it, it, you know, that I applied those rules that I learned from him, just work on it until you get it right. And to respect the audience, let the audience bring something to the film. And uh, that film is going to celebrate its uh, 40th anniversary next year. And it was on Turner Classic Movies uh, a few nights ago. And, uh, and, and yeah, I think your audience, particularly people who are interested in filmmaking, it's called George Stevens, A Filmmaker's Journey. It's on the Criterion Channel. I think it's on HBO Max. Or There are ways to see it. Um, and uh, it, uh, it, you know, when I was able to interview um, I mean, Jimmy Stewart and Henry Fonda and Catherine Hepburn and Warren Beatty and, and directors, Houston and Mamoulian and Capra. It's a, for a film lover. Oh, um, it's or even, a smorgasbord. Uh, yeah. It's a smorgasbord without question. Um, if you could go back in time and give mm-hmm. your 17 year old self, who's just finished having lunch with Elizabeth Taylor, some advice. What advice would that be? Uh, well, gosh, it's it's, it's pretty uh, uh, plain, but f- f- find something to do that you love. You know, that's th- that. And if it's making movies, be prepared for a tough road. Uh, I know you and your show are often exploring with people. How do you get somebody to look at my movie, pay for my movie, read my script? You know, and there's there, there's no short answer for that. It's whatever the circumstances, you have to work with those circumstances. Um, but uh, but to stick with it, and and you may find along the way that you thought, oh, I want to be an actor, uh, and you find out later, you know, I'd I'd like to be a costume designer. I, I've seen that. <clears throat> And or or direct or whatever, and you know, so have some flexibility. Uh, don't kind of set your say, uh, oh, you know, I'm going to be a director because you may find that that may not be your strongest suit. Mm. So, kind of determination and flexibility, uh, and and always to be reminded once you get some control, uh, and gaining control over your work if you're a director is very important and very hard to achieve. Uh, But once you have it, respect the audience. I remember my father saying, and it's from another era, but he uh, he made these wonderful pictures of the early 40s, Woman of the Year, the first Spencer Tracy picture, Joel McRae and Gene Arthur in The More the Merrier, uh, Cary Grant and Gene Arthur and Ronald Coleman. Um, there's just so many pictures. Uh, but uh, uh, he talked about they would open and they 
RKO City Music Hall, which has 5,000 seats. A, a picture of him in front of it when Penny Serenade was mm -hmm. opening, a picture we showed at the Turner Classic Film Festival last week with Irene Dunn and Cary Grant. But he said, there's something when 5,000 minds come together, he said, they close the circuit. They bring their intelligence, they bring their curiosity, and the link is closed between the filmmaker and the audience. And just to have that idea that the audience, he said about Shane, which, you know, classic Western and all, somebody was trying to make it a little fancy. And he said, you know, I think I made Shane for the truck driver in Arkansas. He says he spends a day alone driving his truck and he may not be able to articulate his thoughts, but he's thinking and he's curious about things and he has ideas. And I want to leave a little something for him to do when he comes to the movie. Let him bring something to it. Oh, it's beautiful. That is, beautiful. That is really, really beautiful. You know, since you've you know been raised in Hollywood and you've seen it change from the golden age to where mm -hmm. we are today, where do you think the future of the industry with all this new technology, this new generation that's coming up that is not as in love with movies as maybe my generation or your generation was because so many other options for entertainment right. are out there. What do you think the future is for Hollywood moving forward? Well, it's very much uh, up in the air. And uh, I'll tell you what I hope. It's I hope that the movie going experience revives itself, that there's something more than uh, Marvel comics and the big, you know, uh, the, the pictures that people love for a good reason, mm -hmm. but that that right now it's almost only those that are flourishing uh, in today's theatrical, you know. And I want people to see pictures on the big screen. That idea of my father with five thousand people, if it's mm -hmm. five hundred or a thousand, you know, seeing it with other people. So I'm hoping that that will re-nourish re itself. Um, and of course, there are values to streaming. People, our sets are getting bigger at home and it's a better experience than it used to be. Uh, but it's, it's it, and, and more kind of good directors and writers are now working for streaming. And television, yeah. Because they can tell stories that uh, they want to. And, and that's in my end my plans for the immediate future, because it is a way to tell ambitious stories. Uh, so, and now we have this writer's strike, uh, which uh, is, I think, very serious, because I think the writers are really feeling genuine, and I'm, of course, a member of the Writers Guild, uh, of displacement, that there are just, there are less jobs. And People are finding way and they kind of fear that AI, they're going to start asking AI to write a script or polish a script or whatever. Um, and so I'm very much interested in the writers reestablishing a place. But the, it has changed so much that it, it's going to be difficult, but very important that the studios and the writers and the other guilds come together in a way that's fair. I mean, there are people you know, making $50 million a year uh, right. off of the, the work that these writers are doing. Right. Um, and there has to be some way to find a fair uh, situation that allows this fabulous medium that it is so rich and provides so much for it to flourish. Yeah, but isn't it always the way, though, that the machine will always take advantage of the artist if let, left alone to its own devices? <laughs> I think that is true. I think yeah. that is yeah. right, and that's why the unions are important, and that's why you know collective and all that stuff with with, with what's going on. I agree, and it's more. I've spoken. I've spoken to so many writers on the show um, who are just saying it's just becoming more and more difficult to make a living. Not even become rich just make yeah. a living in the business directors as well because they're becoming more gig orientated like here here's a flat fee thank you very much 
out right. the door you go. And, and and if there was a yeah. job every week, maybe, but yeah, but there isn't, well, you know, if, direct. If people, if people who used to direct television, kind of work I did long ago, um, there were three networks or four networks uh, with a whole season, what, 20, 30 episodes. You know, that's kind of diluted now. I've, someone told me that um, a, a prominent agent I was speaking to two days ago that I think the last strike was 2008, mm -hmm. seven or eight. And that year, the networks shot 55 pilots. Right. This year, there were 15 pilots. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's all changing. And I hope there's some smart enough people sitting at the top and working for the unions that can uh, find a balance that's going to, uh, as I say, nourish this medium that we all love so much. I agree with you 100 percent. I don't want to. I, I grew up in the I grew up in the v, the video store days. I worked in a video yeah. store, and that's where I fell in love with movies. Really? And yeah, that's where yeah. I mean, I was in high school, and I rented movies, and that's where I discovered Giant, and because I could see them all, and I just started, mm -hmm. and that's where I fell in love with movies and became decided to become a director. But I worked in a movie theater, and movies, you know, I remember my first movie in the theater and things. But my children don't like. I've taken them to the theaters, but they're just like, it's nice, but yeah. it's not as it's important. Not. They did not grow up with. It. We're now going to have the first adult generation that did not go grow up going to the movies and Correct. and it's something that's going to have to be managed and uh you know and the idea you can look at a movie on your phone with all due respect <laughs> no matter how clean and crisp the phone is i mean it's 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 a travesty to watch taxi driver on your iphone i mean seriously i mean or giant for god's or, sakes it's the movie itself it's, is called giant you should not be watching it on a small screen yeah to, 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 to watch taxi driver in a taxi <laughs> essentially that's a, well that's a different experience depending on what street you're driving down and who's driving <laughs> this, uh george um what do you hope to leave behind as a legacy in film with the work that you've done over the course of your your life and career well I, I, again i'll encourage people to read my place in the sun or yes. listen to it just come out on the audio book. Yes. Um, that's hard for me to recite, but I, uh, I've, I've, from my standpoint, I love, I've loved being involved in it and, uh, and kind of aspiring all the way. I really did kind of set for myself a standard of excellence and uh, you know, perhaps made a few mistakes along the line, but every time I did it, it was aiming high. And uh, I'm pleased that so much of it, people are, you know, I feel good that this film I made about my father 40 years ago, I, people are still uh, you know, that it's still there and looking great. And we've restored it. And uh, so that test of time, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a respect the audience test of time guy. It's such a beautiful place to be, my friend. Uh, I'm going to ask you a few <laughs> questions I ask all my guests. Um, what advice sure. would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? Well, I spoke about it before, but I'll. Uh, you, 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 I would say to have a, to figure out where you're going, believe in yourself, and keep your eyes open. And you're you're not choosing an easy path, so you have to be prepared for doors to slam, and uh, but make good friends work with friends and uh, set your sights high. What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? I think to listen, you know, listening is very important. And I think when you're young uh, or even when you're old. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on how, how, if you're stubborn or not. <laughs> yes, uh, that, uh, that be, being a good listener. Uh, I remember uh, Jimmy Cagney saying uh, in some context to me, he said, well, I'm a listening actor, you know? Uh, and I think in, 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 in any field, in politics, in journalism, I mean, so many, in, 
And but just as a human being, listen to the other person. And three of your favorite films of all time. Oh gosh. Well, I, <laughs> today, I, today, 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 uh, today. You know, of, of um, you know, I, 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 I like Christopher Nolan's work. Oh. I loved Sarah Pauli's Women Talking. It's a mm-hmm. beautiful film. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, uh, you know, there's just so many. So a third, I think, I'll just say because it's it's 70th anniversary. Shane. Great answer, my friend. And where can people find out about your new book and where can they purchase it? Now, at Official GS, I think is my Twitter uh, <laughs> handle. I'm not a huge Twitter person, but I did put on Twitter yesterday. I came upon a letter I wrote to my father on Gunga Din when I was five, five years old uh, and picture of him uh, on the set. Um, but George Stevens Jr.com is my website, uh, uh, all lowercase letters, uh, G E O R G E S T E V E N S J R.com. And then Amazon, you could buy the book, uh, or Audible to listen. Yes, exactly. George, it has been an absolute pleasure and honor speaking to you, my friend. Thank you so much for not only. Uh, sharing your journey and your knowledge with all of us, but also for everything you've done for the film industry and for the arts throughout your life. So my friend, I appreciate you so, so much. And thank you again. And for many more things to come in your future, my friend. Thank you. Well, Alex, I, I, I enjoy talking to you. I, find, I, I felt I found many shared values with you. And that's always a nice conversation. A pleasure. <laughs>